And this, this week's title is called, In God We Trust, question mark. In God We Trust, question mark. And I really want to address, um, some of you may have your own frustrations. Some of you may be stirred yourself. Some of you may be overjoyed. Some of you may be angry. Some of you may feel f- completely overwhelmed. But I want you guys to understand that as a people of God, we trust in God. And I want to see where that trust really lies in and to recognize in your heart and to challenge yourself where you place these trusts in your life. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. I'll read these verses and then we'll go into in God we trust. And this is Paul writing to the Romans. I know we're going through Acts. We're going to take a little time out. Romans, and he's writing to the Roman church. And I'll give a little bit of context after we read these verses. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Amen. That's the word of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these times, Lord. I do. No matter how uneasy and uncertain, no matter how frustrating and chaotic, Lord, you have everything under control and everything is going according to plan. And so, Father, we ask that you would cause your church to be united today, to trust in you today, Lord, that we ourselves, as we submit to you, submit to the governing authorities and to one another, Lord. This is the order you have created, Lord. And we ask that you would cause your church to separate themselves from the world, to stand for your righteousness, not our own, but yours. So Jesus, be glorified through your church all across the nation, Lord, that we would spend our energy in your gospel to not only proclaim it, but to live it out and to show it by serving and loving So we thank you. Let hope arise in your nation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To give a little context, you guys have to understand that these Jewish Christians and Christians, Gentile Christians living in Rome. Rome at this time was the capital of the whole world, man. It was the epicenter of the entire world. This is where everything was happening. And there were Jews who did not want to acknowledge a heathen, foreign emperor. These Jews had a problem acknowledging the emperor at the time. And not only that, Christians, Jewish Christians and Christians alike, fell under a a conflict of submitting themselves under a heathen ruler. Rome was not a Christian nation. It was very pagan. They had many, they allowed all sorts of worship. And so even with these Jews who resisted, They didn't want to pay taxes to a heathen and a heathen nation. They only wanted to pay what was due to God. And so you guys have to understand in these times there were uprisings. Jewish people uprose, rioted, and there were a couple or several riots that were famous within the Roman times during these Jews, which never amounted to anything. And so Paul is wanting to dissuade the Christian Jews from causing any revolutionary movements. He didn't want them to uprise against the governing authorities. And so when you see this to subject, first of all, 
this chapter and this first half of Romans chapter 13 cause a lot of controversy within um, a lot of people who read this. Because there's a lot of questions to be um, asked about tyrants, about North Korea, about dictators, about Adolf Hitler, about Stalin, about all these evil and wicked rulers. But one of the things I want to address, that's another topic and we could talk about that after. But Paul's emphasis on why he's telling these Christians in Rome is to, is to instill order and to make them understand that all authority is God's and has been given by God. And this is something that we have to be mindful of. So when Paul is saying subject or submit yourself, it means more of your lowering your stance to the authority, more than complete um, uncritical obedience. He's not talking about your complete obedience to these governing authorities. He's talking more of how we posture ourselves to these governing authorities. So obedience is a part of submitting yourself, of subjecting yourselves, but it doesn't mean a complete uncritical obedience. We are to be critical. Because why? We see in Acts chapter 4 and 5, we went through this, when Peter and John themselves got arrested and they were ordering them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And they spoke unto their rulers and said, no, you tell me what's right, to obey you or obey God. And they said, we would rather obey God than men. So the New Testament, Paul, Peter, and all their writers draw this dividing line when the authority crosses the boundary of their domain into God's territory. They give them the right to disobey. That it is for us to obey God rather than you. It is our allegiance to God that comes first. Scripture and the New Testament makes it very clear. Even the old, where you see Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, his three, his three boys who get thrown into the pit of fire. We do not bow our knee to any other God but God himself. And to no other command but the commands of God. But as our allegiance is to God, what the Christians, again, had trouble was submitting themselves under the Roman rule, under Caesar, under the emperor. But the allegiance to God does not mean we neglect our responsibility to secular authorities. Because the authority, Paul clearly states here, has been established by God. He is telling the Romans, you know who put Caesar up there? You know who put the emperor up there? Even Emperor Nero, who crucified and killed even Paul and Peter? He's saying God placed him there. Paul is stating that God is in control and nobody, nobody takes a position of rulership unless it is permitted by God. And I got this and I love this. And this is from my studies from Leon Morris's book. He's a pastor and writer. He said, ordered government is not a human device, but something of a divine origin. Ordered government is not a human device, but something of a divine origin. But now in America, it kind of brings a little conflict because in these times, emperors, kings, they were all, you know, ordained, coming from a single family line. They weren't elected into the position like we have presidents as the people elect. So a lot of the times, Christians will read this, and even for myself, in the past, didn't vote because God's going to place whom he's going to place. But he has convicted even of me that we still live out our responsibilities. Just because God does these things in his wisdom does not give us the right to not do what we are responsible for. We are still responsible to navigate as best we can through the values and the teachings of Scripture through Jesus to vote as we need to. But at the same time, I want you guys to understand government, and as we outcry against government, as we speak ill of government, government is a divine origin ordained by God himself. And Paul views these rulers, no matter how wicked, no matter how heathen or immoral, he views them as God's servants because they serve a purpose of God. When you resist the authority that God has placed, you resist what God has appointed. And this is something that we need to really be careful of. 
I know a lot of us um, get riled up by injustice and the things that have been happening throughout this whole pandemic and um, of all the things of defunding the police and that nature. But when you resist the authority that God has placed over us, Paul is straight saying you are going against God. For God has placed the authorities. No matter how unjust, he still states that the authority has been placed by God. Because Paul is not aware of unjust ways. He is not aware, unaware of wicked rulers. He knows about, he is well versed in the Old Testament history. He is well versed in the politics of the authorities that are governing his day. He is well versed. He used to be with the pharisaical crew that governed over even the Jews. We have Pharaoh. He is not unaware of Pharaoh who God himself ordained, and Paul actually talks about in Romans, and he says, for the scripture says, this is Paul, to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, God raised him up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name, but that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God raised Pharaoh and placed Pharaoh into his place of power. God did that. And he enslaved all of Israel for his purpose. We don't have the wisdom to understand why God does certain things. But it is all for his purpose. And his plan goes on. We have Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He uses the king of Babylon to bring judgment against Judah. He brings king of Assyria to take over Israel. He uses Cyrus, king of Persia, to instill his will. He uses wicked emperors, kings, and rulers for his own glory. And he does that as he pleases. And in Isaiah, it says this, 44, 28. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose. And he's talking about the Persian emperor. Isaiah 45, 1, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. He calls Cyrus, the Persian emperor, his anointed. And he says, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. He uses this heathen empire, emperor, to do his purpose and to bring about his judgments. They are all used for God's glory. Paul was very well aware of what happened to Jesus. That a perfect, righteous, and completely innocent man was unjustly killed. And we know when Pilate said to Jesus, I have the power to set you free. And he tells Jesus, I have the power to either crucify you or let you go. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says to him, you would have no power at all if it had not been given to you. From above. Jesus himself in death subjects and submit himself to the governing authority to give up his life and die. And he tells Pilate, my father gave you this authority. That's why you have the authority. And Jesus, trusting in the father, submits himself to that authority. Paul's own injustices that happened to his own life the unjust floggings, countless amount of beatings, countless amount of being stoned and left for dead, being jailed unjustly. And even in this situation, Acts 23 will get to, he is before the council, before the Sanhedrin. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you ordered me to be struck. Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul himself, when he is unfairly being treated and unfairly being judged, submits himself to the rulers that are governing before him. Why? Because he trusts and he places his life in God's hands. 
So accordingly, when he is stricken and he is placed under unjust suffering, he still submits himself to the governing authorities. Paul understands that there are unjust rulers. Paul and Peter understand that there are wicked rulers governing over them. Paul's main emphasis, again, in these verses is that order and authority are given by God and we are to keep that order. And I'm talking to you as Christians. The world may erupt in chaos. The world may go up in rioting and looting and cause all sorts of disorder. But we are not to follow along those footsteps. We are to separate ourselves to live according to the God-ordained governing rule. We subject ourselves because God is in control and we are God's people. You guys have to understand this. And Peter says the same thing. Peter says exactly the same thing Paul is writing. And you guys have to understand that Paul and Peter are living under a wicked emperor. You guys got to understand in their time when Nero came in, he, he caused so much grotesque killings of Christians. And they themselves didn't just teach their people to submit themselves. They submitted themselves to death. They walked in and they died. They didn't cause an uprising. You don't think Peter and Paul, when you think about these things, could have gathered the churches and caused some kind of revolution, even though it might have been weak or put down real fast, I'm pretty sure Peter and Paul could have rallied the churches and did something about it. But they allowed the church to be, not allowed, but they themselves submitted to the point of death. We are to submit ourselves. And Peter says this. He said, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. This is the will of God. You guys get this? This is the will of God that we submit. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. You guys get this, that it is pleasing to God, and it is the will of God that we submit ourselves in this way. Now, I know all of you guys, most, you know, I'm probably the most unpolitical person here in this room, but I've been following along closely with what's been transpiring in this nation. There is an uproar. There is uncertainty. There's frustration. There's joys. There's allegations of cheating. There's suck it up, you sore loser. All, you know, the, the, the country right now is so divided, so divided. I have never witnessed this in all my life, 40 years. Never witnessed something like this. Never witnessed, I'm not even political, and I know we've never had an election week. But no matter what happens, church, we as Christians stay true to our character. In our conduct of what Jesus has been teaching us, we stay true to that, no matter what is happening on the outside. If we truly believe in God's word, in this and in what Paul is saying, no matter what circumstance, I don't care if you think that, let's just get this straight. Whether you're on the side of Trump, whether you're on the side of Biden, I don't care. This is what you need to understand. If you are on the side of Trump, and you believe that there is all these cheatings going on and you're frustrated and you're rallying and you're stirred and you don't know what to do and you're overwhelmed and you're angry, guess what? No matter the situation and the circumstance that Trump is in, if God, and I want to make this clear too, I don't, uh, I myself, look, Trump right now as the president is ordained by God. Whether you like him or not, I'm going to say this clearly. He has been placed there by God. And as someone who's been placed there by God, I know uh, 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 many of us I've had conversations with, 
in our church that speak very ill of Trump. They hate Trump and spew hate for Trump. It is very dangerous as a Christian. Paul even states, and it is a command of Scripture, that you do not speak evil of a ruler of your people. We do not behave in this way. Why? Because if you speak ill of your ruler, you speak ill of the one who placed him there. God placed Trump as the president of our United States. If what Paul is saying is true and what God's word says is true, then Trump has been placed by God. But I also want to make something else clear. I can't tell the future, nor do I know what God wants right now. And I don't like when Christians say Trump is God's president for the next term as well. And there's other people, Christians, who say, no, Biden is the chosen one. How do you know that? I don't get the arrogance and the pride of certain people to say, oh, this is God's. God wants this. How do we know that? But as Christians, whether you're on Biden's side or Trump's side, we wait. We do what we're responsible for, but we wait in peace as brothers and sisters for the outcome because God is in control. Don't antagonize one another. We're all on the same side. I don't get why there's division. I get it why there's division out there. I don't get why there's division in here. God places the rulers. And if Trump or Biden wins, you must subject and submit yourself to the ruling party. I don't care who wins. We as a people understand that God places them and we submit. We submit to that. We don't identify with the political party. We identify with Jesus Christ. We identify with one another. And this is what I was kind of reflecting on. If you identify more with your certain political party more than, and their ideologies, more than the brother and the sister that is sitting in this room, more than the brother and the city, uh, sister that is in your family groups and a part of Glory LA and a part of the churches all across the nation and the world, if you side with or identify yourself with your political party more than the church, you are the problem. You have an identity issue. You are causing division within the church. I don't care if you think God's side is this or that. We are the party. God and Jesus is our ruling Lord. This is something you guys have to understand. And whoever wins, we submit. And we are at peace with that because God did it. And don't antagonize one another. Don't rile one another up. If you see that what you post and what you keep shouting causes someone to stumble and get irritated and frustrated and sad, stop posting your nonsense. Is it so crucial for you to get what your opinion and your agenda is in this political time? It's not. I'll tell you that. It's not. I don't care what you say. Nobody cares what you say. Because why? God's going to place who he wants to place and whom he has chosen. And why would we disrupt and divide ourselves over that? We must be at peace. We are not like the world. And what's sad is, as, as I'm reflecting, and I sometimes fall into this too, guys. I'm not trying to, like, bring this all down. But, man, it's something we got to recognize as a people of God. We are not the world. What's sad is this. I've never seen so much of our people represent and shout out so loudly about Trump or about Biden, about the left or the right, about their conservative or their liberal views more than Jesus Christ. Christ, why can't we represent so passionately Jesus in the way we do about our political agenda and our parties? When I talk to people, people are so well versed in their politics, so well versed in the policies of their political party. But are we meditating night and day on the policies that Jesus Christ is instituting in his word? Do you know and live by the policies that Christ is wanting us to live by? I have issues with this. 
I don't get it as a Christian people, as a people of God, that we're so rooted into the world. You know why we get stifled? You know why we get frustrated? You know why we get stirred, angry, and overjoyed because of one party losing or winning? It's because my life is rooted in the world. My trust and my hope comes from the governing authorities to give me what I need. I place the responsibility of my life and the outcome of my life on this Trump, Biden, Republican, Democrat, liberal or conservative. So when one loses or wins, I get angry, frustrated, sad, or I get overjoyed. Why can't we be overjoyed that, that Jesus is ruling over us now and that he is my king and he has placed me in an amazing kingdom that is founded on perfect righteousness, truth and order? Love. Why can't we be about that? Why can't we try to get people into that political party? We got it all messed up in our heads and in our hearts. We're living for the wrong things. And I fall in this too because I had to reflect. And there was a reason why I was frustrated, a reason why my heart was getting stirred, a reason why I see all this division and conflict and it just didn't settle right in my heart. But in the things that I advocate, I also had to reflect on my own. And we talk about policy, right? I vote for this pol uh, political party because their policies are more Christian. No, no, no. This, this political party has more Christian values. And, I've, and, I, and, I'm, and I fall into that too. I've had conversations and we had our fun discussions. But when I started honestly reflecting upon my own life, so these are just, there's an et cetera and a list of things, but I just took these four that I was kind of meditating on, the poor, immigrant issues, abortion, LGBTQ rights, and I was reflecting on this. And we advocate for the poor and the immigrants, right? But when did God tell us through his scriptures that the government needs to take care of these things? Doesn't the responsibility fall on you? Doesn't it fall on me? But I see that instead of challenging my own belief and life to help the poor, to feed the poor, to house the poor, and God says even in Leviticus, he says, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, he's talking to Israel, you shall not do him harm or wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And we talk about these immigration policies. And we bring the responsibility onto the government. But are you willing to take an immigrant into your own home to treat them as your own family? Are you? Are you willing to feed them, house them, nurture them? And I'm only speaking to you like this because I've been speaking to my own heart. As I advocate for these rights, even for abortion, we talked about that last week in abortion, I drew a hard line. And I've been reflecting, if I advocate for life, am I willing to go to these clinics, to these women, to these families, to these men who are in a hard place to make a hard decision to bring the gospel and to show them love? That if they decide to have their kid, to bring them into a community that will support them to raise their child in a community. Are we willing to do that if we advocate for life? We can't just give the responsibility to the government and say, oh, I advocate for life. How dare you kill life? And we do jack thong about it. I'm going to try to stop cussing. But you guys get it? We do that. I do that. I believe in these things. I'm moved by these things. But I'm not willing to lift a finger for these things. The church, you know why there's no hope outside? You know why these people rely upon their government, rely upon all these things? Because this church has not brought that hope into the world. We are lacking. We are not living as we should. That's why they look elsewhere. That's why they look to Trump, to Biden to the liberal movements, to the conservative movements. But God has given the church the responsibility to uphold its morality, to be the vessel of light and truth, the city on the hill for the world, to see that there is hope in this world. Where is that light in L.A. for us? 
And I love this. And I was watching this testimony from this pastor, and he was giving this sermon. And he was straight preaching the gospel. And I got stirred. I got moved. And this pastor, him and his crew, um, his church members, they, uh, they go to um, abortion clinics a lot. They go to abortion clinics, and they try to really convince um, people not to get abortions. This is the amazing thing about them. They not only just convince people not to get abortions, but check this out. So he's telling this testimony. He's at an abortion clinic. And they're picketing and they're having conversations. And there's a guy that won't let these, uh, his, his people into the abortion clinic to simply talk to people. And this guy's an atheist. And the pastor ends up having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And they're um, getting into a really deep conversation. And um, one of their church members um, gets frustrated because he sees that, man, like, it's, it's not working out. Like, where's God in all of this? Like so many babies are getting killed and this, this atheist guy is not, is not budging and he got frustrated. And so this guy ends up walking, they're in the back and this guy ends up walking to the front. And as he's walking to the front, there's a man with his wife and his wife is about to get an, an abortion. And this guy is, he, he said he was in conflict and he's pacing back and forth in the abortion clinic and this guy's praying. He's saying, God, if you don't want me to get this abortion, you need to give me a sign. Give me a sign right now. Give me a sign. And so the guy is walking to the front, and he has a picket sign, and he's just frustrated. The church member, he's frustrated, and he's holding the sign, and the dad that's praying looks out, and he sees the sign. Don't get abortion. And he's like, what the heck? He goes, no, 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 that can't be God. That can't be God. And he goes, God, if that is you, if that is you, Make that guy's car that white van. He goes, if that guy's car is that white van, I won't get a, an abortion. So the dad walks out of the abortion clinic and he asks him, he goes, I'm so sorry, Let me, can I just ask you, um, did you come here in a car? He goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, what car did you come in? He goes, that white van. He rushes in. He stops, they're, they're, they're starting the procedure. He, he stops the procedure. And so the pastor is giving this testimony, and he brings out the mother and the child that they saved. He not only goes to the abortion clinics to stop abortion, he brings them into a community so that the community could help raise, help support. That is what the church is supposed to do. That not, not only do we advocate for life, that we bring them into a community to support life. And when I heard that, I was like, damn, that's a man of God right there. That's a church that I want to build. This is the city on a hill and the hope the world needs. And I know I covered that we should not speak ill of our presidents. And this is something that I lack. Not that I speak ill. I don't speak ill of our presidents, but this. I want to ask you, as a church, how often have you prayed for your ruler? As a Christian, how often have you prayed for President Trump? No matter how much you hate him. And this is Paul, 1 Timothy. He says this, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. You guys get that? This is good and it is pleasing. This is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How are we as a church and as a Christian praying for President Trump in the past? Have we prayed for him more than we spoke ill of him? Or have we hated and spewed hate more than our prayers for him to lift him up? And I hope even in Biden, if Biden wins, I hope the church could pray on behalf of him. If Trump remains, I hope we can start praying for our rulers to cover our presidents, to do what is right according to God's plan. Can you submit to that? Can you submit to that? 
The deeper issue really is, can you submit to God? The deeper issue really is, do I trust God? That's the deeper issue. It's because I can't submit to God, nor can I trust God. I can't trust these authorities. I can't trust what's over my life. And I see this. And in Romans, Paul talks about this. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear witness that they have a zeal for God. He's talking about these Jews who are pursuing their own righteousness. And Paul wants them to be saved. But he says, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Willing to, seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You guys get this? They wanted to glory in their own righteousness. And a lot of the times, the way we see and pick our candidates and our political parties, we have our own agendas. We feel what is right to me, and we pick it. And it becomes more than the righteousness God is trying to instill. People have an issue submitting to God's righteousness. Why? Because I want to establish my own way, my own righteousness, what I think is right. And isn't that the issue? Why we get so bothered when it doesn't go my way? If Trump doesn't get picked, damn. F all this. Biden doesn't get picked, angry. Why? Why does it affect you so much? As a Christian, I'm talking to Christians. I understand why it affects the world so much, but as a Christian who have such a higher hope, why does that affect us so much? That's something you gotta think about. It's something you gotta challenge yourself and look deep into your heart about. And trust. And I wanna close this. Can we get the praise team? Submitting to God's righteousness. And so we come to a place of trust. Trusting God. Trusting God's wisdom in all of this. Trusting God's purpose in all of this. Trusting God's intention, his goodness, his love in all of what is playing out. First Peter says this. But if when you do good... And suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. What Peter is saying is this. You have been called to suffer when you do good. You guys get that? When you do good and you suffer for it and you endure, this is a gracious thing to God. And Peter goes on to say, for to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps the righteous one who suffered because of good he suffered doing good he committed no sin neither was deceit found in his mouth when he was reviled he did not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly he trusted that God would prevail and that God would judge everything that he was wronged in and that God would make everything right and that at the end that Christ would be glorified in all of these things. And isn't this the issue? That in the things that I'm wronged in, I have to make it right. I have to make it known. Christ himself entrusted his life to the one who judges justly. And I love this as I'm talking about Peter and Paul. The reason why I love these guys so much is, man, they walked that walk. They entrusted their lives to God. That at the end, that they knew that the Father was watching as they submitted to death. That as everyone is being judged, that they would be glorified amongst all of creation of what was wronged. Imagine that glory as God praises Peter and Paul of their unjust death in front of all of creation. And so Peter is saying, this is the will of God. This is what pleases God. That when you do good, you suffer. And as you suffer, you trust God. 
there is injustice in this world. There is wickedness. Things aren't always going to be right. But we don't uprise. We don't cause revolutions. We don't cause discord in this place. We trust the one who judges justly. What's our hope in this? Our hope is that the promises are true. That there is a kingdom awaiting me, awaiting all of us when this is done. Where there is no more pain, there is no more sorrow, where everything is perfect, where everything is glorious, and God's love and goodness over his people is so pure, felt, where it's so This is the hope that we endure for, that we endure to the end, to get to that perfect kingdom. It's never going to be perfect here. It's not meant to be perfect here. And I'm not saying that we don't do our due responsibility to do what we need to do, but it's not going to be fixed here. There's a perfect place of waiting us. Let's pray.